Good afternoon to each and every one of you and what a delight it is to see so many people here for this first event for a very long time and we always sort of held our breath on how many would turn up after such a lengthy period when we've not been able to meet together. So I'm delighted to see so many people here. I'm delighted that we can gather once again in this place and it will be a real joy, I'm sure, as we learn so much about this musical organ that we have, that is so much a part of who we are at this Minster Church. And Darren, as I say, is going to tell us about it, but also is going to demonstrate, with the help of himself and Thomas, our organ scholar here too. So I'm not going to keep you very long at all, because I'm sure you're ready to just listen to uh, some organ music and listen to Darren. So uh, uh, let's show our appreciation first of all to Darren and welcome him as we start this event here. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen and welcome. Um, so the plan is I'm going to do a short brief history of the instrument and then I'm going to play um, a, a J.S. Bach piece uh, which fits this organ superbly and beautifully and then between Thomas and I we will demonstrate the various sections and colours of the organ. Thomas will play a couple of pieces and then um, I'll bring everything back together um, in, the, in the final piece. So, so here we go. So um, just a very, uh, as I said, a very brief history of the instrument. Uh, in the former church, um, as a lot of you will, will know, the former church um, was on this site and it's kind of the same kind of floor space as um, this church. Um, the difference was there were uh, balconies and galleries in the old perpendicular church and the predecessor to this instrument began its life um, at the west end on a big gallery and then just before the fateful fire of 1853, um, about a year before that, it was moved up into the chancel of the old, of the old church. The organ at the time, um, very, similar, very similar to this, was one of the largest organs in the country, um, second only to that little minster up, up the road at York. Um, so it was a very fine instrument. It was built by a company called Harris, um, and people from all over the country came and played it as they, as they do with this instrument. So we had that fateful fire of 1853. My predecessor, uh, Jeremiah Rogers, at the time, um, decided um, to find an organ that would be fitting for this spectacular building. And with a friend of his, who was then organist of the Temple Church in London, they both visited um, the Great Exhibition of 1851. And there are a few organ companies um, exhi exhibiting at the time. And there was one in particular from Germany called uh, Schultz. And Johann Schultz um, had been given a personal invitation um, by the then Prince Consort, Prince Albert, to come and exhibit at the Great Exhibition. Um, Jeremiah Rogers and his friend, the organist from the Temple Church, were very um, taken with the Schultz organ. Um, so they decided to visit some of the organ builders in the UK and visit many of the organ builders uh, um, across Europe. And finally they decided to go with Schultz. Um, so they um, signed a contract with Johann Schultz originally for a slightly smaller instrument that we have now, a three manual, what we call in the, in the organist world a three manual. So three keyboards plus a pedal board. Um, but suddenly, before the work began on the construction of the instrument, Johann um, died very suddenly and Edmund, his son, took over. And as most sons want to do with their fathers, they want to do better than their fathers. Uh, and in, then in consultation with, uh, with um, the organist of St. George's, um, they decided to increase the size of the instrument to a five manual, so five keyboards for the hands plus the pedal board and um, it was then to be the largest instrument in the UK overtaking um, York Minster um, and then um, but just as it was being built um, Father Willis built a organ for St George's Hall in Liverpool and that was just slightly larger by the time the organ was built and put into place here in the, in the Minster. So um, the organ here um, is as I said is a, is a five manual um, with the pedal board and we have 94 speaking stops so we have 94 different slightly different colours 
um, to use uh, on the organ. Uh, we're very lucky to have a five manual organ. Um, the only other places around the country are places like Westminster Abbey, St Paul's Cathedral um, in London. Um, and there is one actually down the road at Wakefield Cathedral, but one of my predecessors in the 1930s um, left St George's to become director of music at Wakefield and missed his fifth manual so much that he had an extra manual put on the organ at Wakefield. So, um, so that's why they have a fine manual at Wakefield. So when the organ was built, uh, when the organ was put in um, in 1860, um, in 1860, uh, it took about two years to complete the work, and during that time, Edmund Schultz and his workmen lived and worked in the building, um, voicing it into the building and putting it all, all together. Um, it's no exaggeration to say, once the organ was built, um, it then became a very important instrument in the UK uh, and took the UK organ building in a completely different direction. Um, and then many of the UK organ builders, very famous ones, um, Harrison's, Hill, Willis, and especially T.C. Lewis um, came up to discuss the work with Schultz and Jeremiah Rogers and to hear the instruments and to play the instruments. And one of the greatest influences of this organ is the T.C. Lewis uh, famous organ at Southwark Cathedral um, in London, near London Bridge. And a lot of his, a lot of the Schultz work, um, T.C. Lewis incorporated into that very famous uh, cathedral, cathedral organ. Um, so the organ is, is, is in its original spot in the church, which is on the north side of, of the chancel. Um, I think in the original plans I did see at one point that should have been a chapel of some sort, but the organ was placed in there. Um, and originally the organ was powered by six burly men who used to power the organ and um, pump the wind by by foot, um, and in the passageway coming from the, the outer door into the choir vestry, the original passageway is, is still there, but none of the me mechanisms are there. Um, so that all took place, and then in 1862, there was a grand rededication of the organ, um, and the St. George's Parish Church Choir, along with the Choir of Leeds Parish Church, sang at that dedication service, and by all accounts, it was a great event, and was full of music. Um, and full of full of organ music. So, um, so that, the, that's the organ up until 1862. In 1894, the original Schultz organ console, uh, where the organist plays from, uh, was replaced um, by a company called Abbott and Smith, and was situated in its original position. Um, so, after after the talk, um, if you walk up into the choir stalls, you'll see. The original doors to the original console it's no longer there but the shorts was replaced by this Abbott and Smith console in the same place and at the same time a gas engine was incorporated um, to uh, wind and to, to use uh, play the organ uh, one of the first I think one of the first organs in the country to use a, a, a gas engine so that organ then carried on its life um, until 1910 when Norman and Beard um, in consultation with the then um, organist and choir master, decided to make some tonal changes to the organ. So up until 1910, everything was original uh, Schultz material. So in 1910, I think probably because of the way organ music was, was going, um, it was decided to add some new stops to the organ. So these stops were some concert flutes on the solo division, clarinet was moved from the choir division up to the solo division and a new tuba um, or a tuba was installed so before that there was no tuba and, and no concert flutes um, that work has now become an integral part of the instrument um, some organists and organ consultants think uh, that, that that section of the organ should be retained in any organ rebuild or any conservation Others think it should be discarded as it's not original. So there are these discussions about what to do in the future uh, with, with the instrument. So that organ then carried on until 1935, and during between 1910 and 1935, J.W. Walker, which then was one of the great organ builders of the UK, took care of the organ. 
Um, and they designed a new organ console, um, which was in the church until 1999. So many people who worshipped here in the 70s and 80s came to the organ recitals or sang in the choir will, will remember that very famous organ console. And that organ console was um, pushed down tabs. And it was a beautiful mahogany um, console, very, very large. Um, and only two of those were made one for Doncaster and one for Tewkesbury Abbey. Um, and both of those are now uh, with, um, are no longer in those churches, but with, with um, an, organ, an organ builder um, being taken care of. So then that organ console was not put in the original position, was put on the left hand side, the south side, sorry, of, of the Minster, um, what we call in musical terms the um, Cantoris side. And a new organ loft was built in the Foreman Chapel, and that's where that organ console uh, remained. So that organ console uh, remained, uh, stayed there until, from 1935 till 1999, and, and then it started to, to um, deteriorate, and it was decided to um, seek uh, new funds and um, design a new organ console. And our organ builder at the time, who is still our organ builder, Andrew Carter of Wakefield, in consultation with Nicholson's of Worcester, designed a new pull-out stop console. Um, and that's the console that we have now, and it's still in the organ loft in, in, the, Foreman, in the Foreman Chapel. Uh, as I said out at the very beginning, we're so, so lucky um, in this town to have such a fantastic building and to have such a fantastic instrument. Uh, the organ is used almost on a daily basis for teaching, uh, for individual practice, and of course, for its Opus Day, for what it was built for, to accompany the services, Corley and others um, in, in, in the Minster. Um, and just a very kind of side thing to that, um, we've been very fortunate over the years, especially since I've been here, we've had some fantastic organists um, resident in the church, and we've been very lucky to have a, such a fantastic group of organ scholars over the years. And, and for them, it's been so fantastic um, to, to be able to use such a comprehensive instrument. This instrument is about, there's about six and a half thousand pipes, we think, um, all crammed into that north chancel space. Um, and it's larger than a lot of cathedral organs around the country. So our organ scholars, resident organists, are, are very lucky to have such a comp comprehensive and fantastic um, instrument to play uh, almost on, on a daily basis. So, that's a very, just very brief history of the instrument. I'm going to shut up now, and I'm going to walk over to the organ loft, and I'm going to play a piece by Bach called the Allebrev in D. And for those who are Bach lovers, the BWV number is 589.
example of um, the kind of registration um, organist used for Bach. And obviously because this is a German organ, it just fits um, the Bach organ works just absolutely, uh, absolutely perfectly. So um, now we're just going to take um, a few minutes and to demonstrate the various colours and, and sections of the organ. So as I said in my brief introduction, the organ at the moment is a five manual and working from the bottom keyboard upwards so we have a choir division, a great division, swell division, solo division and an echo division. So we're very lucky to have all those divisions. And they all kind of what we call couple through onto the great, apart from the echo division, because originally in the Schultz uh, specification, the, the echo stood alone and didn't um, copy through to any of the other, other keyboards. And as I said, we're very lucky. Um, we're one of only six or seven um, organs in the UK to have five manuals, which includes Westminster Army and St. Paul's. It's always good to mention those uh, places because they're so big and important and we're up there with them. So that's good. Um, so we're going to take a, uh, take a very short tour now around the organ and this is where Thomas comes into the picture. Um, and I just want to say thank you to Thomas for staying over this afternoon and helping out with this. So on the great division we have what we call the principal chorus. And this kind of, um, kind of underpins the organ. Um, I was talking to a, fr uh, a friend who is um, very knowledgeable on this, on, on this organ and a member of the congregation. And what, apparently what you do when you're building an organ, you start with your principal chorus and everything is tuned and voiced from that. And that's where, you're, that's where the rest of the organ comes from. So this is an example of the great principal chorus. Then we have a flute section. We have flutes on all the keyboards, right up from the choir all the way up to the, um, the echo. These are the, uh, the choir flutes. So we're going to start from the bottom. Choir flutes. These are the eight foot and the four foot flutes. And then I'll explain what I mean by eight and four foot in a minute. to the great flutes which are slightly larger sounding and slightly thicker uh, sounding so the great is the main accompanying keyboard of, of, of the organ and you can play all the divisions from from the great so these are the great eight and four foot flutes <laughs> moving on to the swell we, uh, we're very lucky here we have two two um, sets of flutes on the, on, the, on the swell. And these are the smaller um, swell flutes. And Thomas will um, um, show off these. Um, these are included in, um, inside a swell box with shutters. So um, Thomas is going to start with the, the shutters closed, and he's going to open them and then close them again to give you that kind of effect. flutes are what we call the harmonic flutes. Again, just very slightly thicker, slightly bigger sound, and again, he'll, he'll um, demonstrate those with, um, with the swell shutters. Okay, and then moving on to the solo flutes. Now, the, um, as I said in my introduction, these are not original short stops. These were um, installed in 1910 by Norman and Beard. Um, and these are what we call concert flutes. Again, slightly thicker sound, and all the stops on the solo. Solo department is a kind of department where you can have things that stand out just very slightly differently. So when we're playing something soft, 
but you want a solo tune, then you would use the, the, um, the flutes on the solo. And for instance, if we're playing something quite grand, uh, like a hymn, but we want to lead the congregation a little bit strong, stronger, we would then use the tuba. So these, these stops are on slightly bigger wind pressure to the rest of the accompanying sections of the organ. So these are the solo flutes. Trying not to make eye contact with um, somebody in the in the congregation. I hope he's here. Is he here? Actually, he's not here. Actually, so um, but um, Thomas is going to add the tremulant to the solo flutes. Now this um, kind of disrupts the air, and so what you'll hear now from the solo flutes, hopefully, if the tremulant is working correctly, you'll hear a, a, a very particular sound, and you'll find the, these sounds on kind of um, what we call theatre organ, so the tower ballroom, and I like to use, I like this sound, and I, I like to use it sometimes on a Sunday morning during the communion, and it just gives it a lovely effect. So these are those solo flutes, but with the added tremulant. <laughs> So Thomas is now going to put all that together, and he's going to play um, a piece by Grieg, um, a piece uh, originally written for two pianos, but it's been arranged for organ, um, and it's, uh, it's called the Norwegian Dance. So I'm just going to go around and page turn for him and press a couple of pistons.
on the organ. Um, and then, so we're going to start with the swell reeds this, uh, this time. So we're going to start with the, the small reeds. Again, the whole of the swell section is an, a, is an accompanying uh, section of the organ. So it's enclosed within a box uh, with shutters. And you, you, can, uh, you can sort it, um, you can pl use the, um, the lever, a foot lever on the swell box to um, color, color, the, color the music. It saves, it saves the organist having to change stops every time. So if you want something slightly softer, rather than changing your registration, you can just close the box and then reopen it when you need. So these are the swell reeds with the box shut. Thomas will open the box and then we shut the box. To the great reeds. So these are some of the louder stops on the organ, on the on the um, hand uh, keyboards. So these are the great reeds. These are not enclosed in a box. So the great is un as we call unenclosed, and um, they're just very loud all the time. <laughs> Just those, those, those are only four stops out of the 94, and that's probably a lot louder than a lot of parish church organs if you had all the stops out. So it sh just shows how very loud uh, this organ is. And then on the solo, we have a soft reed, which is a clarinet, um, and this um, is, was originally on the choir division, but then in the 1910 um, um, alterations was uh, transferred onto the solo. And this, again, is in a box. The solo department, apart from the tuba, has its own little swell box. So this is the clarinet with, with the box shutters being used. And then probably the single loudest stop on all the keyboards, this is the 1910 tuba. Now, as tubas go, it's probably not the best tuba in the world, um, but um, as it's not an, um, an original part of the Schultz uh, specification, um, it blends in as, as best, it, as, as, best as, it, as it can, um, with it being an English tuba, um, put on a, a German sounding organ. So this is the tuba. The tuba is not enclosed in a box, so it stands out all by itself, and again is used for big fanfares and leading large congregations. <laughs> So this is the department where you play with your feet. Um, as I said earlier, um, when we were going through the, the, um, the flute section, we, had, we were talking about the eight and four foot. Um, so these are all the different pitches. So the eight foot is the pitch where um, not people normally speak and, and sing. So a soprano in their uh, regular range would sing at an eight foot. Four foot is an octave higher and a two foot is an octave above that. Um, and then the other way, in the pedal division, you have 16 foot and 32 foot. So you have an octave lower at the 16 foot and an octave lower than that on the 32 foot. So we have a 32 foot flute and we have a 32 foot reed. Um, some organs, not very many, have a 64 foot uh, reed. There's one at Liverpool Cathedral and there's one at Sydney Town Hall. And there's a silly organ in Italy which has a 124 foot uh, stop.
but you can't, act, you can't actually hear it. Um, so these are our combined pedal reeds. So this is the, these are the 8 foot reeds, the 16 foot reeds, and the 32 foot reeds. Now those pipes for those stops are right at the back of the organ, so closest to the east window, and they form a part of the vicar's vestry, or one of the walls of the vicar's vestry. So you'll never find the vicar or any of his church wardens in the vestry during the closing voluntary on a Sunday morning. And it's like very far away, down there at the back. So, so if the vicar keeps you talking on a Sunday morning, it's probably because there's a loud organ voluntary going on. So you can stay at the back. So, putting all that together, um, Thomas is going to play a piece in a minute, but just before I forget, because I originally forgot, about five minutes before we started, Thomas and I kind of remembered in unison that I hadn't mentioned the echo division. So hopefully Thomas has put the music desk up. So the fifth manual is underneath the music desk, so when we want to use it, we have to lift the music desk. So um, this consists of an eight foot, a four, two four foots, a two foot, and a 16 foot. And this is just kind of like, um, as, as the name suggests, it's kind of an echo of the whole organ. Um, and it's very unique in German organs. There are a couple of Schultz instruments in the UK still, and some of them have echo divisions, but it's a very unique thing to German organs. So Thomas is going to demonstrate the eight foots by themselves, the four foots, the two foots, and the 16 foot, and he'll just put all that together for you. That's all the five manual divisions of the organ. Thomas is now going to amalgamate all those, all those reeds and the principal chorus and the tuba, and he's going to play a short uh, tuba tune uh, by uh, C.S. Lang. And he doesn't need me for this, so I'll just stay down here for this.
one thing I should say, really, um, now that we've had uh, Thomas's pieces, um, when you're accompanying a choir, most of the time you play it like a piano with your hands. So you're just playing with one keyboard, and then obviously you play with your feet as well. But the two pieces Thomas has played, he's played two keyboards at the same time, most of the time, and his feet. So it's, it's a, quite a complicated instrument to learn, but once you've learned it, um, it's absolutely fantastic and just a great opportunity to drown out a full church of singers on, on, a, big, on a big organ. That's what organists live for. Um, so that's really the, the fantastic Schultz organ of Doncaster Minster. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to Thomas for staying over this afternoon and helping us uh, with this demonstration. Thank you for coming, supporting the work of the Friends and for coming along today to um, um, hear this talk and to, and to um, have a little bit of a social event. Um, I've printed um, the recital, pro recital dates for next year, 2022, once our toilets and kitchen area has, uh, is, has been completed. We'll restart the recitals in January. And on the door, as you go out where the uh, collection plate is, um, there is a copy of all the dates, including the programme for the first recital, which is, um, is going to be given by a great friend, um, Jordan English, who's assistant organist at St. Giles's Cathedral in Edinburgh, and has played here many times. Um, it's a fantastic programme, and I know this because I chose most of the pieces for him to play. <laughs> so it'll show off the organ to, abs uh, to absolute perfection. So if you can come to those, to all of them, or to any of them, please do put the dates in your diary. Um, entry to the recitals is free. And, and there's a retiring collection. Um, so, to finish off with, I'm now going to jump back on the organ and I'm going to play a, a piece by um, Sir Edward Elgar called Cantique. I played it last Sunday um, at the end of the Eucharist, but it's going to be slightly different today. I'm going to try to amalgamate all those different sounds that we've heard all this afternoon, and I'm going to try to amalgamate these, hopefully, fingers crossed, if I know which keyboard, to, remember which keyboard to play, and the organ works for us. Um, I'm going to show all those colours in, the, in this piece, um, and it's called The Cantique by um, Edward Elgar.
your behalf can I uh, say a huge thank you to uh, Darren and to Thomas for all what has been explained to us and all that has been played for us. Uh, can we have you out here? We've been talking about Thomas, I don't even know if you know what he looks like. But, uh, can, so let's show our appreciation for what they've said. We shall be handing out the question papers for you now to see what you've taken in and see tomorrow when he's playing to accompany the worship if you can tell which of those keyboards he's actually playing from. Uh, it, it, we are blessed, are we not, to have such a wonderful instrument and certainly people who can play it, which actually is what really matters indeed. It always amazes me when uh, we, I'm invited to go behind into that organ uh, by certain people here to actually see it um, and how it produces the sound that it does from what it looks like is quite stunning and if you ever have an opportunity to see um, then then I would encourage you to take that up because it does seem to be it's held together by wire and bricks and, th and all these various pipes that go everywhere and to produce the sound that it does for us is quite stunning I think and that is testimony to the organ itself a testimony to those who are playing it indeed. I had uh, a couple who were getting married in a couple of years time this week who came here um, and they were in December, we were chatting about the, we uh, the wedding and I said are you going to have organ music or some other form of music and she said oh I'm not sure about the organ, I haven't heard it and it just so happened that Darren was here and I asked him if he would just play a little bit for them. Well, as soon as it started, and I think you played the wedding march in it, and tears started coming down this, uh, this young bride's uh, face, and there was no question that she was going to have the organ for, this, uh, for her special Can day. I just say the tears might have been the way I was playing it? He <laughs> <laughs> pinched my line there because I was going to say it wasn't because it wasn't how it was being played. It was how it had touched her, and I think that's what we say, don't we, when we are here. And I think we have a bit of that today, in that we are touched by the music, and so enhances the worship. And it is a real joy to work from a minster like this, where the music is daily, the organ is played daily, really. And we are blessed to have it, we are blessed to, as I say, to have those who play it, and, and we are blessed to those who support it, because it does take quite a lot of energy and a lot of money to maintain an organ like this and we are blessed by uh, grants who support us through the Pilling Trust but we are uh, blessed too by people who give to support it too but also out of the general giving of the church here to, to maintain it. There will come a time when it will need a lot of money to rebuild it in a way and that will be a few years down the line where there will be a major project because these sorts of instruments do take a lot of upkeep of time and money, and certainly that was, it will be what's coming. Um, so it's a great joy certainly to have you here, it's a great joy. I've learned, I have to say, some more about the organ myself, and I hope you have too. This has been a, a Friends of Doncaster Minster event, as you know, and I thank those friends who are here who have supported it. But also, if you aren't a friend of Doncaster Minster, but would like to be so, I do have a, a little leaflet here, should you wish to join, or you can contact us online, or just speak to some of the people afterwards, and we can get you to become a member. And we enjoy ourselves as friends, we do good work in supporting the work of the Minster, supporting this building, but we also have lots of social events too, and we enjoy each other's company. So if you want to know more, while we share our refreshments up in the former chapel, then uh, just ask us what, it all, what it's all about if you're not already a friend and would like to think about or explore being, uh, being a friend. As you also leave, as has already been mentioned, there is a, a, a plate for a retiring collection. Anything you give, greatly be received by the friends of Doncaster Minster, we're going to support the work of the Minster and this building. And there are also some preserves that have been put out specially for you to buy today and take home and enjoy and see was prepared those and there's an opportunity for you to do that as well. Thank you for your support. Thank you to those who have put on this event for us and especially those who have prepared the refreshments. And again, when we go up there, 
Again, keep your distance as is appropriate to yourself. And if you want to bring stuff away from the Fulham Chapel, because you feel that that's safer for you, that's absolutely fine. Be in control of the distances that you are yourself. Thank you once again for your attendance and your support. And let's finally show our appreciation again to Darren and to Thomas for all that they've shared.